Hiya, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. Um, I come to you this afternoon and I wanted to give you a book review. I wanted to review the book, You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington by Alexis Coe. All right, this is a book I recently checked out at the library. Sorry about that glare. I uh, recently checked this out at the library. It, uh, it was a good... It had its good points and bad points, and I wanted to uh, sit down and discuss this with you. Just a few basics. The book is 261 pages long. The actual text of the book was only 200 and I think four. Let me double check. Oh, excuse me. With the acknowledgments at the end, it was 209 pages. And then the rest of it is index and notes and sources, stuff like that. But uh, this book by Alexis Co. is from Viking Press, and it is a 2020 book. It's a brand new book, just came out. Um, and to show you a little bit about the book, there, it doesn't have you know, really any pictures. It does have these really cool, um, kind of cool graphs, or not graphs, um, charts. And she goes over various things in his life and puts it into a table so that you can, so I guess not a chart, a table, um, but it, it puts the information into an organized uh, structure uh, like this one, lies we believe about the man, about the man who could not tell them. And so it's got lies and then truths. Um, anyway, it does, it's got a few places in the book where it kind of lines things up like that. And that's, that's kind of a neat little deal with the book. There's, and, and when they, when I saw that picture, look at that face. Yeah, that's the face of a shyster. That's the face of a guy who's been doing some stuff he shouldn't have been doing. And that immediately caught my attention. It really, uh, I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. And so I grabbed the book and I, I got to flip it through the pages, just kind of a fast, you know, flip. And then I, I realized, okay, this is a regular biography. I, it's not, maybe not what I thought it was. So I checked this book out and I brought it home. And when, when I got to reading it, and by the way, this, is, this was a really fast read. It's very fast paced, easy to pick up. Um, the, you know, an average person could read this pretty quickly. One afternoon is my guess. Took me three. I'm slow. I can't help it. Uh, plus, I didn't have, you know, with the funeral and stuff this week, I didn't have all that much time to be sitting down all at one time, you know, a big, long set period of time to read. But anyway, fast paced book. Um, so when I first sat down to read it, uh, I probably did the wrong thing. I read the preface and the introduction first, and then I ran out of time. And that's where I, that was the point I had to stop. And I'm telling you what, that was not a good place to stop. Because the preface and the introduction to this book, in my opinion, is terrible. Absolutely terrible. It put a, just a nasty taste in my mouth. And I was so irritated at the unprofessionalism of the author that um, I, I question, you know, once I get into a book, I usually read all the way through. I get, you know, committed, I'm vested, and I was tempted to take it back to the library. But I wanted to do a book review on it, and so I thought, okay, so give it a chance. Just give it a chance. Um, it's probably good that I did because once you got past the preface and introduction, the rest of the book was a was an okay biography. If you're an amateur reader who has never picked up anything on Washington, this would be not a bad one to start with. I'm not going to say it's great because it's not great, but it's not a bad one to start with. But what I really wanted to focus on here right off the get-go was that preface and that introduction because it bugged me to no end. Uh, so, first of all, in the opening pages, it comes across as a, uh, a man-bashing book, okay? It was an uh, extreme feminist point of view, and I have nothing against women and women's rights, so please don't, like, leave a ton of comments and start bashing me. Hear me out. I don't like man-bashing. I don't like woman-bashing. I like to sit in the middle and be even, you know, even keel here with, without going to the extremes. I don't like the extremes. Matter of fact, when I wanted to, do, when I went to make this channel, that was one of the things I had in mind was, I don't want to go to the extremes. I want to just enjoy reading for the sake of reading. All right, I don't have an agenda, but 
the the lady that wrote this book, Alexis Co, seemed to almost have an agenda right off the get-go. And what really bugged me is it reminded me so much of modern day politics, which is another thing I was not going to mention in my videos. <laughs> but it was so just extreme. Um, it was a catch your attention uh, lines that should never be used in a professional work. How about I just leave it at that? And let me, I'm going to give you some examples so you understand what I mean. Uh, so please be patient with me and hear me out. Um, so as she gets into it, she first of all starts talking. Um, she talked about Annette Gordon Reed. And uh, well, well, okay, let me back up. She talked about when she looked at all of the authors of George Washington biographies, they were pretty much all men. Okay. Um, and it really bugged her because it was only from a male chauvinist point of view is basically what she was saying or what I took from it anyway. And then she gets into, she starts talking about Annette Gordon-Reed. And for me, when I read this part in the, in the, I can't remember if it was the preface or the introduction, in the, in the opening part of the book, it felt to me that she was trying to put herself in the same class or on the same level as Annette Gordon-Reed. Now, I I have read a little bit from Annette Gordon-Reed. I have her books on my shelf. I got to get to them. I'm excited to get to them. I've listened to her her lectures, and she's very very good. The author here, Alexis Co, is not Annette Gordon-Reed. Not even close. Not the same uh, scholarly class. She's just not there. And so it really bugged me when she was trying to compare herself to that, or I felt she was anyway. I could be, maybe I'm reading into it, reading reading it wrong, but that's how I that's how I took it. And and I feel Re, uh, Annette Gordon Reed is a great biographer. Uh, she when she was talking about Jefferson in her book, she had a huge story to tell. And uh, it totally was a game changer in American history. It totally changed the historical record. And so when I was reading this, the way it sounded was like Alexis Coe was going to do the same thing for the, the story of George Washington. And then, of course, that stinking title popped out there. You never forget your first. You know, you're, you're expecting this big game-changing uh, story. And that's not what happened. There... <sighs> Ah, there was no breakthroughs. The story she told was the same story that every other author has told. All right, there was nothing new. There was uh, one or two interpretations that were different, but they were not so much that they were like historical game changers. Um, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, she she, uh, she gets into this book and she talks about uh, the, the male authors who had wrote biographies on Washington had missed huge opportunities through their entire book. Um, but here's my thing is I think she missed huge opportunities. She didn't, like I said, she didn't do anything new. Um, let's see here. Uh, everything that she had had in her book, all of the stories, the whole storyline, I've heard all of them before from all of the male authors that she was bashing. And so it really just, I'm telling you, it left a nasty taste in my mouth after reading the first two, um, the, the preface and the introduction. It just really, really bugged me. And uh, I probably should have read one or two more chapters before I put it down because I was, I was just angry. So anyway, um, let's see. She talked about busting these myths of Washington's life. Guess what? The myths that she's talking about have already been busted. They've been busted by almost every other big name author that's tackled George Washington in the biographies. So there's nothing new. And it just bugged me that she claimed there was something new. Um, let's see here. And then her in her unprofessionalism, in that preface and introduction, I think it gets more into it in the introduction, she calls out several of those big name authors by name. A couple of them have won the Pulitzer Prize for their works. Now, I don't know about you, but usually when you win the Pulitzer, you've done something right, all right? Um, so, let's see. Um, in her descriptions, she makes all kinds of innuendos about uh, these authors and their descriptions of Washington, which just sickened me. It was unprofessional. It was not scholarly. Um, you, you know, if you read the... This is this was my, my thing. Is She, she talked about... Um, <laughs> what did she call them? She called them... The thigh men. She said that these authors were always talking about how size matters. 
really unprofessional, just sickened me. And um, the thing that really gets me is, you know, they talk about in the descriptions of Washington, his big hands, his big feet, his, you know, six foot three and a half uh, stature, his, um, you know, all these, these descriptions of the physical side of George Washington. And she said every male is so obsessed with that, that they, you know, and she called him, the, like I said, the thigh man and that size matters and all of this. Well, hey, guess what, Alexis Co. If you read the primary sources, all of the people from Washington's time period said the same thing. It's not like these guys that she's that she like pinpoints, these authors that she pinpoints that, that she says they're obsessed, they're not really obsessed with anything that the people in Washington's time period weren't obsessed with. Because I'm telling you, the males and the females all made comments about what George Washington looked like and his physical stature and when he walks into the room, how he's a commanding presence. Whether it was Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Abigail Adams, uh, you, you know, it's male and female. So it's not like these men are just obsessing about size matters. That really just irritated me. I can't stress enough how much that irritated me. And uh, if you ever talk to, well, you won't talk to my daughter, but <laughs> you, my daughter had to listen to me kind of rant and rave about this. It, it irritated me that much. Um, so anyway, she she didn't do anything new with, with what she was talking about. Uh, the, the authors that she pinpointed and, and made these comments about were Ron Cheneau, Joseph Ellis, Richard Brookheiser. I have read all three of them. And... Um, there was another author that I had not read, but I've read all three of these guys' biographies and they are very, very good. And Alexis Coe is not in the same class. And um, anyway, I just thought it was very unprofessional. Um, and I would beg all writers to stop that kind of writing. It's, it's disgusting. Um, it's what American politics has become. And that is absolutely disgusting. And it just needs to stop. Become a professional in your area. Oh, gives us gives historians a bad name. Let's see. Alexis Co makes comments about Trino taking certain scenes from his imagination and basically reworking it to make it more creative. Hey, guess what? That's what all writers do. And as I was write, reading your book, you did the same thing, Alexis Co. There's no difference, and that really that really irritated me. When you don't have the set. Um, you know, some of the things in the historical record, sometimes writers do that. That's how you fill in the space and make it, um, I don't want to use the word entertaining because it's not strictly for entertainment value, but that's what makes people pick up the book, all right? And I don't think anything that Ron Cherneau did in his biography was, uh, you know, too out of sync with what would have been going on, in, in my opinion. Um, all writers do that. Let's see, and it's okay to disagree with one another's interpretation, but do it in polite ways. And I've said that already. Uh, use proper etiquette. Be a professional. Overall, once you get past the preface and the introduction, this is not a terrible biography. It's, it's all right. It does an okay job of running you through the time span of Washington's uh, life. Now, I will say that this, this biography is not like an in-depth biography. Again, it's only a couple hundred pages. You can't do Washington's entire lifespan in a couple hundred pages and expect to, you know, go in depth on stuff. It's uh, it's an inch an inch deep and a mile wide, I guess, is what you you could say about it. Um, let's see, it's same story that I've read before, um, but I would give it I would give it to somebody who's never read Washington. Um, rip out the preface and the introduction. I would I would not want anybody to read it. It's trash. Absolute trash. But once you get into chapter one and then all the way to the end of the book, it's not bad. Now, um, her stuff that she does in here, it is not extremely well, uh, it, it's not well sourced. There, there was not a, it, it does not seem a ton of research done. Now I say that with, you know, the chapters aren't that long either. So I got to kind of be careful saying that. But I have read Cherno, I've read Ellis, I've read, you know, all the um, uh, Brookheiser, I've read these other guys, and I've looked at their sourcing. Their sourcing is much more in depth than what this was. And so for her to say some of the things that she said about those other authors, that's what just really drives me nuts. Um, I think I've said enough. 
I, I did bookmark I did bookmark a few places um, and I hesitated on you know reading some of this just simply because um, I didn't know if I was being petty or not because I... after defending Washington the thigh men usually turn their sights on Martha blaming her for the couple's childlessness uh, there's little to suggest she endured difficult births during her first marriage, but very, the very notion that such births can be linked to infertility is enough for them to cast a critical eye in her direction. If anything, the fact that Martha had children at all offers convincing evidence that she remained fertile in her 20s when she married Washington. But she had said, you know, she's sitting here trying to prove the fertility of Martha, and she says Martha had two children coming into the marriage. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, if you're trying to prove the fertility, why would you not mention all four of the children that she had? Because she had two of them that died um, in um, when they were real young, you know, less than five years old. I can't remember exactly how old. But why would you not mention all four of them? Because that would, you know, that would definitely prove a little bit more about the, the fertility issue. Um, and see. then she goes and she's talking about James Armistead Lafayette. And she says, oh, and again, I'm probably nitpicking, but it just bugs me. So I'm going to share. Let's see. Um, he remained in America, still enslaved, and considered three-fifths of a person. In 1782, Virginia, where Lafayette was from, passed a manumission act allowing any slave to be emancipated by his owner. And then she goes on to keep, you know, she keeps reading this. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, if you're saying 1782, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, I could be, uh, the three-fifths person thing was a constitutional issue, wasn't it? That's 1787. So her time frame when she's talking about why, you know, why would he stay in America and that kind of stuff after the revolution? Yeah, you're off on your time frame there with your with your comment. She, she's talking about Washington and freeing his slaves, and, and Washington's often credited as the, the only founding father to free his slaves, and that, you know, and she, she says that, well, this isn't fair because Benjamin Franklin did, and for me to compare Washington to Benjamin Franklin, that's not fair. You got to look at the context of stuff, and I know I'm not giving you a lot of background on this, but you know Franklin freed his slaves earlier in life. But you got to remember Franklin's from Pennsylvania, and he didn't have that many slaves. He he did have some, but it was like very few, very very few. And he lives in an area where the Quakers live, which the Quakers would go on to um, outlaw the use of slaves themselves. And to, to compare a middle colonies guy like Ben Franklin, who also used to live, you know, he's got a little bit of New England, that New England culture in him, to compare him to Southerner George Washington, that, that in itself is not fair. Because the people of the, the New England and middle colonies were way different than the people of the Southern colonies. It's a totally different culture. And so it's not a fair comparison. And so you, you, know, you get things way out of context. And... So anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. I think I need to probably wrap this up. If I was to uh, rate this book, as I said, if you ripped out the preface and the introduction and just shredded it, um, the rest of the book, it is readable. There, there are some interpretations that I don't agree with, but but it is readable. It's a, it's a decent story. Um, I would probably rate it a three out of five. Uh, I hope this helped you in... Whether you're going to read this book or not, you never forget your first by Alexis Co. Hope this helped you. This has been Rutenberg's Reviews, and I am Bill Rutenberg, and I am now signing off. Happy reading.